The date was Thursday, January 24, 1980. On that day, an incredible story was told of the deportation of a Nigerian politician by officials of the federal government under the control of the then ruling party, National Party of Nigeria, NPN, now defunct. The victim was Abdurrahman Shugaba Dharma, a member of the then Baruno State House of Assembly, elected on the platform of the defunct Great Nigeria People's Party, GNPV, led by the late apostle of politics without bitterness, Waziri Ibrahim. Shugaba, a popular grassroots politician and richly blessed with oratorical skills, was elected the majority leader of the then Borno State House of Assembly. Shugaba was a thorn in the flesh of the then ruling party at the center, NPN, which came up with the sad novel idea that the best way to get rid of him was to deport him to a neighboring Chad. He was categorized as a non-Nigerian and classified as a Chadian. He was deported on January 24, 1980 on the strength of a deportation order signed by the then Minister of Internal Affairs, Belo Maitama. There was a drama in the High Court during the politically motivated suit against the then government. The NPN-led federal government brought an old Chadian woman to the court who cried profusely that Shugaba was her long-lost son. Shugaba denied knowing her, claiming that his mother resided in Meduguri and was well known. The court, in a manner reminiscent of the wisdom and famous judgment of King Solomon in a similar dispute of a child, wasted no time in dismissing the false claim of the Chadian woman dressed up as truth. The Shugaba political venture turned out to be a shameful political vendetta which collapsed like a pack of cards before all the hierarchies of the court. The High Court, the Appeal Court and the Supreme Court struck it down and without any dissent described it as a reckless abuse of power by the government and a gross violation of a citizen's rights, all in pursuit of despicable political vendetta. Shugaba returned to Nigeria triumphantly. We live in a country where everything is politicized. We don't allow the law to talk. That's why we're having all of this controversy. And for as, as far as I'm concerned, it's uncalled for, it's unnecessary. In the light of all of this landmark pronouncement by the Supreme Court of the land, they shouldn't be. It was heartwarming to note that the late President Shehu Shagari obeyed all the court judgments. He did not refuse to respect any of the court decisions because rule of law was his administration's mantra. The incident certainly was a bad publicity for Nigeria. There was a strong feeling that such condemnable act will become history and its despicable vestiges can be buried. But a little over 39 years after, the Shugaba episode is being resurrected with the plethora of legislation and democratic dispensation who could ever imagine the reenactment of the Shugaba episode? A saw foundation is already been laid with an attempt to secure a legal legitimization. The frame-up has already been formulated as a ground before the cut. How unimaginable can this be in Nigeria of 21st century? This has expectedly become the center point of political discourse with particular focus on citizenship. Until 1914, there was no country called Nigeria. What is now known as Northern Nigeria was inhabited by different ethnic nationalities, kingdoms and socio-economic formations.
The same applied to southern Nigeria, which was previously inhabited by different independent ethnic nationalities, kingdoms, and socio-economic formations. In the year 1914, under the Governor General Lord Frederick John Dertry Lugard, the British government formally united both the Northern and Southern Protectorates as the Colony and Protectorate of Nigeria in an exercise known as amalgamation. It is factually correct that the emergence of modern-day Nigeria is traceable to the 1884-85 Berlin Conference. In 1884, at the request of Portugal, German Chancellor Otto von Bismarck called a meeting of European powers in Berlin to end the conflict over the scramble for territories in Africa. For the over three months the Berlin Conference lasted, the European powers haggled over territories all over Africa. On February 26, 1885, over 134 years ago, the 13 European nations and the United States of America ended their meeting in Berlin. The meeting lasted between 15th November 1884 and 26th February 1885. It was largely dominated by Europe's insatiable search for minerals and markets. The conference imposed a new map on Africa. It divided Africa into 50 irregular cultures and regions. The countries were carved out in utter disregard for cultural linguistic boundaries, nationality, geography, and other unifying factors. And the Berlin Conference was a conference in Berlin eh, that uh, under Bismarck that brought the European powers on a table to scramble and partition Africa on a table. The whole continent was divided on a table without consultation with the various leaders, the various kings and obas and chiefs. Africa was divided. Under the partition arrangement, what was then northern and southern protectorates in Nigeria was under Great Britain in its collection of colonies. What was then southern and northern Cameroon was first under the control of Germany following the mandate of the League of Nations. The precursor to United Nations Organization, UNO, between 1922 and 1945, the two areas became a trusteeship territory of the United Nations, handed over to Britain to administer, after Germany was defeated by the Allied forces in the First and Second World Wars. This lasted between 1945 and 1961. In Yola, capital of Adamawa State, northeast Nigeria, a military cemetery still exists where the German soldiers killed during the First World War by the Allied forces were buried. All what I know from this uh, cemetery is that the fallen heroes, that's the army, uh, foreigners that they did uh, World War fighting. So they are the one that buried here and I'm the one that taking care of the place to clear it every blessed month. Anti-colonial struggle began in Africa as early as the 1920s. In 1960, both the British colony Nigeria and French colony Cameroon secured independence. This development raised concerns about the political future of southern and northern Cameroon. The two areas were neither colonies nor protectorates of Nigeria or Cameroon. The fear over their political future was allayed by a plebiscite in 1961 conducted under the supervision of the United Nations. On October 16, 1959, the United Nations General Assembly adopted Resolution 1352 
confirming that the people of the United Nations Trust Territories of the British Cameroons would achieve independence by deciding through a plebiscite to join either Federation of Nigeria or the Republic of Cameroon. The UN ordered that the plebiscite should take place not later than March 1961. The plebiscite took place on February 11, 1961. The UN plebiscite in both the British Northern and Southern Cameroon was a major event in the political calendars of both Nigeria and Cameroon in 1961. Both Nigeria and Cameroon were desirous of having the two territories integrated into either of the countries. On the day of the referendum, Nigerian leading newspaper The Daily Times came up with a banner headline, Join Nigeria for Peace and Progress. Prime Minister tells Cameroonians with a rider, otherwise poverty and hardship. On the eve of the referendum, Nigeria's Prime Minister Sa Abubakar Tafar Balewa addressed the English-speaking people of Cameroon on Radio Nigeria. He assured them of their future if they decided in the plebiscite to rejoin Nigeria. The Daily Times story was based on his address. Let's refresh your memory with the speech. Many of you who are listening to me this evening will be familiar with the recent history of the relations between the Southern Cameroons and the federal government. But I shall repeat the outline so that you may be reassured that you, through your government, have treated the Southern Cameroons fairly and indeed with favor. So far, from exploiting the people of Southern Cameroons, as have often been alleged, the federal government of Nigeria and its predecessor, the former central government, has in fact done all in its power to assist the territory in its development. I need not remind you that the territory of the Southern Cameroons is a trust territory, a mandated territory which the League of Nations and its successor, the United Nations Organization, entrusted to the United Kingdom. This mandate started in 1922, and from the year, the Southern Cameroons was administered as an integral part of Nigeria, sharing to the full the services which the Nigerian government provided. Indeed, they received more than their share, which was strictly due to them, and it is a fact, a fact which cannot be disproved, Every single year from 1922 until 1949, the central government subsidized the Southern Cameroons. And even after that, when the financial position of the Southern Cameroons improved, the central government made special arrangements to ensure that the surplus each year in respect of revenue and expenditure attributable to the Southern Cameroons should be devoted exclusively to the welfare of the people in the trust territory. Not only did the central government do all these, but only two years ago, the Federal House of Representatives decreed that the amount of advances made by the federal government to the southern Cameroons should be completely written off together with the interest which had accrued from year to year, and also that the advance of working capital which the federal government had made to the southern Cameroons should be converted into an absolute gift. That was plain evidence of our goodwill towards the people of the southern Cameroons. Before I recount the material benefits which the trust territory has received from its partnership with Nigeria, let me tell you of the political undertakings which we in Nigeria have given to its people so that they may know exactly what their status will be 
if they choose to rejoin us. In this connection, I would remind you of the policy which independent Nigeria has since last October proclaimed towards all her neighbors and to the other states in Africa, namely that whatever their size, whether they be small or large, they will be treated as equals. So it is with the Southern Cameroons. This small territory with a population of under 1 million will have the full status of a region, equal with the huge northern region, equal with the eastern region with its population of over 8 million and the western region with its 6 million people. While the number of elected members of the House of Representatives will be in proportion to the population, the full allowance of 12 senators will be accorded to the Southern Cameroons, just the same as the North and East and West. I know I speak for my colleagues, the regional premiers, when they say that we do indeed desire to procure the friendliest relations. There is absolutely no question of any feelings of hostility or any ill intentions. We feel that they and we are members of one family and nothing will give us greater pleasure than welcome them home again. My message to the people of Southern Cameroons if I may speak for a moment direct to the people of the Southern Cameroons, I ask you to examine very, very carefully the issues which are at stake. On the one hand, you can choose certainty and security and honorable status as an integral party of a big nation in Africa with your future assured. With Nigeria, you can look forward to sharing in the tremendous economic development of our country, to sharing in the massive schemes for expanding education to an extent hitherto beyond our dreams, and to the social benefits which we are now beginning to enjoy. Above all, you can be assured of the security of the rule of law the protection of your lives and houses and farms and to the guarantee of your human rights. All these are waiting for you if you choose to come back to Nigeria. And now, ask yourselves, what is the alternative? You will throw in your lot with a country whose government has made no firm promises to you and has given no undertaking, a country which unfortunately has been torn in recent years by civil wars. It pains me to mention these things and believe me, I take no joy in the misfortunes of our neighbors. But it is my duty to warn you of the dangers which lie ahead of you if you go down that road. If you do so, then you cannot expect as of right to live in peace, to cultivate your farms in peace, or to receive the same justice which has been provided for you until now. Instead of peace and prosperity, instead of more schools and hospitals and improved communication, which you may genuinely expect from a reunion with Nigeria, you will risk losing everything. On January 1, 1960, the French Cameroon became independent and adopted the name Republic of Cameroon. Nigeria secured its independence from British colonial masters on October 1, 1960. The Southern Cameroon, mainly Christians, joined Cameroon on October 1, 1961, even though the people are now describing the date as the day darkness fell on them, a euphemism for regret. 
tace sai a je rayu to sai a je su to ba abin da zai yi sai a yi plebiscite anuna menene masewa the development of our communities can be traced to the colonial era when the Germans ruled the territory known as the Northern and Southern Cameroon, from Dikwa in the north to Limbe on the Atlantic coast. The territory divided into two were United Nations Trust territories to British at the end of the First World War with the signing of the Treaty of Versailles. The Allied forces defeated the Germans. Several German soldiers were killed. They were buried in a military cemetery in Yola after the First World War. After a series of plebiscites in 1959 and 1961, the Northern Cameroons joined Nigeria to form the then Sadana province, and the Southern Cameroons formed a confederation with the French-speaking Cameroon. The plebiscite of 1961 was very unique. For the first time, all the leading political figures in Nigeria were united for a common cause. The contributions of six key politicians towards the favorable outcome of the plebiscite in favor of Nigeria in the British Northern Cameroon would remain indelible in the annals of Nigerian history. Tafawa Balewa, Amadu Belo, Obafemi Awolowo, Aminu Kanu, Namdi Azikwe, and Joseph Taka stood out as voices of courage and reason in convincing us to join Nigeria. Our people in all the communities were in a state of ecstasy following the outcome of the plebiscite. This was largely informed by the fact that the politicians promised us a lot of goodies that would guarantee for us a full, useful and contented life. But the Nigerian nation reneged on the promise to create a state for us. Mubi, which became the capital of our territory after the 1959 plebiscite, was a prosperous city. The first airport in modern-day Nigeria was constructed by the Germans before the First World War. Yet, our territory was denied the status of a state. We are unhappy. It's an injustice because all the old provinces are now states in Nigeria. We opted to join Nigeria in 1961. We have no regret. It was because of this that we did not opt for a fresh plebiscite in 1986, 25 years after the one of 1961, to determine if we are to remain or opt out of Nigeria as directed by the United Nations Resolution after the 1961 plebiscite. We are Nigerians and we shall remain so. We shall enjoy all rights and privileges like other citizens. The British Northern Cameroon, inhabited largely by Muslims, joined Nigeria on June 1, 1961 and was renamed Sadona Province to honor the then premier of defunct Northern Nigeria, Sir Ahmadu Bello the late Sadauna of Sokoto, who campaigned vigorously for the unification of British Northern Cameroon with Nigeria. The outcome of the referendum shows that a majority of 60% in the British Northern Cameroon voted in favor of integration with Cameroon. 642,637 voters were registered for the plebiscite. A breakdown shows that in British Northern Cameroons, there were 243,955 registered voters and 331,312 voters in British Southern Cameroon. In the Southern Cameroon, 233,000 people voted in favor of integration with Cameroon while 97,741, representing 29.5%, voted in favor of Nigeria. In the British Northern Cameroon, 146,296 people, representing 60%, voted in favor of integration with Nigeria while 97,659 voted in favor of Cameroon. Officially, British Northern Cameroon became part of Nigeria on June 1, 1961. It must be pointed out that as at the time the British Cameroons became a German protectorate in West Africa and administered as a League of Nations mandate 
after the First World War and later as UN Trust territory administered by Britain after the Second World War, after the defeat of Germany, there was no country known as Cameroon. In the pre-First World War era, the territory was known as German Cameroon Colony. The defeat of the Germans led to the split of the territory to free, first under the League of Nations and subsequently UN Trust territories of French Cameroon territory, the Northern British Cameroon and the Southern British Cameroon. The necessity to engage the citizens of the Northern and Southern Cameroons in the self-determination exercise through plebiscite was prompted by the independence of Nigeria and Cameroon in 1960. Two separate plebiscites were conducted to determine the future of the territories. First, a plebiscite took place in 1959, precisely on November 7. The territories rejected a union with Nigeria. The 1959 verdict necessitated the establishment of a regional quasi government headed by Sir Percy Wynne Harris as governor with capital at Mubi in present day Adamawa State between November 7, 1959 and June 1, 1961. The UN whose responsibility it was to supervise and prepare its trust territories for self-government, then organized the February 11, 1961 plebiscite. On April 21, 1961, following the outcome of the second plebiscite, the United Nations General Assembly passed a resolution divesting Britain of its trusteeship. The resolution was coded 1608 of April 21, 1961. This paved the way for the UN Trust Territory of Northern Cameroon to become part of the Federation of Nigeria. Today, the people in the areas that participated in the plebiscite and voted in favor of Nigeria are located in three states, Adamawa, Taraba, and Borno in modern-day Nigeria. It covers 83,831 square kilometers of land. In Adamawa, there are 12 local governments comprising Fufore, Ganye, Hong, Madagali, Jada, Meiha, Sung, Mayo Bewa, Michika, Mubi North, Mubi South, Tungo. In Borno, there are five local governments Bama, Dikwa, Gutunga, Gwoza, Kala Balge. In Taraba, there are seven local governments Ardokola, Bali, Gashaka, Kurmi, Sardaina, Kuru, Takum. By simple deduction and on the premise of the local government's configuration, it will be a rape of the constitution to imagine that the people in the listed local governments are not Nigerians. In particular, the people of Jada in Adamawa state are bona fide citizens of Nigeria and it will be ultraverse the power anybody or institution to say or do anything to the contrary. The presidential candidate of the PDP, Alaji Atiku Abakar, is indeed a Nigerian. He was born in this town and he started his school, his primary school, from his junior primary school to senior primary school in Jada here. Jada is a well known town in Adamawa State. Adamawa State is part of Nigeria. If we are not from this country, then let us, let them divide us and give us our own country. The result of the 1961 plebiscite may have dissolved in history. By simple constitutional verification, no citizen of Nigeria be ostracized or denied his or her citizenship. 
The irresponsible nature of the Shugaba case should remain a hard historical lesson and any subterranean attempt to reenact it is a complete violation of the 1999 constitution. The 1963 constitution, particularly I want to refer you to section, section 10 of that constitution, provides that, that in fact, by the time you look at that section, that section 10 I'm referring to under the 1963 constitution, subsection 2 provides a special provision touching on individuals that belong to the trust uh, territories, making them citizens of Nigeria. That special provision, you will see by the side note that it covers individuals that were part of the trust territories by implication the 1963 Constitution Section 10 sub 2 makes them citizens of Nigeria. Now, when you come to the 1979 Constitution, in the saving provision of the 1979 Constitution, this is what it provides. Notwithstanding any reference in this chapter to the national status of any of a person, at the time of that person's birth, in relation to a person born after the death of his father, be construed as a reference to the national status of his father as at the time of the father's death. And that is to say, if before the 1979 constitution, whatever status your an individual's father enjoy before the 1963 constitution by section 10, that person stands to enjoy the same status under the 1979 constitution. Now the saving words of that 1979 constitution is captured in section, section 309 of the 1999 constitution. Now by implication, in fact, section 309 of the 1999 constitution carry the exact wordings of the saving provision of 1979 constitution. So by implication, the right that an individual enjoy as a citizen of this country as conferred by section 10 under the 1963 which was moved as a saving provision under the 1979 constitution is carried down into the 1999 constitution as a matter of a legally speaking there should be no controversy as regards the status whether nigerian citizen or not if there is one thing or a combination of several factors that suddenly brought resuscitated interest in the 1961 plebiscite and raised it to the front burner of political discourse. Currently, it is the declaration or assumption in some quarters that some citizens of the old northern British Cameroon who integrated into Nigeria may not have been or are not Nigerians. Perhaps this may largely be due to lack of understanding of the letters and spirit of the Nigerian constitutions since 1963. There are also assumptions that those fanning the embers of the controversy are either deficient in the historical facts or lack proper understanding of the integration process. Available facts show that the issue of the two plebiscites in 1959 and 1961 was top on the agenda of the one-month pre-independence history constitutional deliberations attended by 80 delegates from different parts of Nigeria at Lancaster House in London in 1958. Ostensibly flowing from Nigeria's interest in the free territories in Cameroon, then northern and southern British Cameroons, as well as French Cameroon, the then northern region government made the following declarations in respect of the northern British Cameroon. That with effect from 1st of July 1960, the area of the northern trust territory shall be constituted as a separate province, which will be known as the trusteeship province and which will be of equal status with the other 12 provinces of the northern region until 1st October, after which date 
the area will be temporarily administered directly by the United Kingdom. The regional government also declared then that if in the forthcoming plebiscite, the people of the trusteeship territory decide to join the Federation of Nigeria, they will do so on the terms accepted by all political parties at the London Conference, and the area will be administered as a separate province of the northern region. This will guarantee the newly established native authorities of Gwoza, Mobi, Chamba, and Gashaka Mambila their proper status within the framework of the native authorities being subordinated to any existing native authorities outside the boundaries of the new province. The UN took a landmark decision after the 1961 plebiscite when Northern British Cameroon opted to become part of Nigeria through a vote that if after 25 years the territory is dissatisfied with the union, a fresh plebiscite will be conducted should they want to opt out. That fresh plebiscite ought to have taken place in 1986. It did not, and so 58 years after, the then Northern British Cameroon remains part of Nigeria. Some people have argued and some say wrongly too that there is no known act or parliamentary resolution on the status of citizenship of the people born in northern Cameroon. Section 10 of the 1963 Nigerian Constitution clearly defined and recognized citizenship by plebiscite. The provision accorded them all rights and privileges as citizens by birth under special provisions as to Northern Cameroon. This is in addition to earlier decision of the then Northern Region government prior to the plebiscite. Once a state, for instance, is created, like for instance, some states were created here in the Northeast, Gombe, Borno, Yobe, and Adama were created out of North is and that does not mean to say that you cannot benefit from the present state that has been created just because you were born when the state was under the northeastern part of Nigeria. The 1963 constitutional provision states for the purpose of determining the status of persons connected with the part of northern Nigeria which was not included in the Federation on the 31st day of May 1961, the foregoing provisions of this chapter and subsection 3 of section 17 of this constitution shall have effect as if a. for any reference to a particular date where there were substituted references to the last day of the period of eight months beginning with the day next following that date and b for any reference to the former colony or protectorate of nigeria other than the second reference in section 7 there were substituted a reference to the part aforesaid and c that other reference included a reference to the part aforesaid two Nothing in subsection 1 of this section shall prejudice the status of any person who is or may become a citizen of Nigeria apart from that subsection. Not a few people knowledgeable in law are of the strong opinion that the fact that the 1963 Republican Constitution is no longer in use cannot render ineffectual the issue of the citizenship of the people of Northern British Cameroon who opted for Nigeria in the plebiscite. The framers of the 1999 Nigerian constitution, which is in pari material, the same as the 1979 constitution, may not have expressly state who is a Nigerian citizen by plebiscite. 
Perhaps this was due to the fact that the 1963 constitution not only captured it but settled the matter. Contrary to the perception that the 1979 constitution and its replica, the 1999 constitution are silent on the issue of citizenship by plebiscite, there are clear and unambiguous provisions of the two constitutions that support the 1963 constitution that the inhabitants of the UN Trust Territory of Northern British Cameroon are full citizens of Nigeria by birth. Section 17, subsection 3, referred to under Section 10 of the 1963 Constitution, provides Any reference in this chapter to the national status of the father of a person at the time of that person's birth shall, in relation to a person born after the death of his father, be constructed as reference to the national status of the father at the time of his father's death and where that death occurred after the 30th day of September 1960, the national status that the father would have had if he died on the first day of October 1960 shall be deemed to be his national status at the time of his death. There is no doubt that by the above provisions, inhabitants of the United Nations Trust Territory of Northern Cameroons are full citizens of Nigeria by birth, reading from Section 7 of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1963. However, it is being argued that Section 23 of the 1979 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria and Section 25 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, 1999, are both silent on the issue of the UN Trust Territory of Northern Cameroons. As such, they are not recognized as Nigeria's citizens, talkless of being citizens by birth. We submit that this is not the true position of both the 1979 and 1999 constitutions of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Section 268 of the 1979 constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, which is a transitional provision and saving, provides, notwithstanding the provisions of Chapter 111, of this constitution, but subject to section 26 thereof, any person who became a citizen of Nigeria by birth, registration or naturalization under the provisions of any other constitution shall continue to be a citizen of Nigeria under this constitution. Section 309 of the 1999 constitution has altered also has exact wordings of Section 268 of the 1999 Constitution, save for the sections that deal with persons that have dual citizenship who cannot retain their Nigeria citizenship unless renounced. A notable legal practitioner submitted that the argument that some persons are not Nigerian citizens by birth is palpably a fundamental fallacy due to grammatical misreading of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria 1999 as altered. This legal interpretation has put the hammer on the right top of the nail.